Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session uh, for make Cassandra compatible, faster and more reliable. Uh, I guess we're on time so we can make a start. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank okay. you. So Okay, uh, let's start. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shiroki Yamada, uh, CTO at Scaler. So we're uh, talking about uh, our contributions to Apache Cassandra today. So um, I'm Shiroki, and then I love database systems, distributed systems. And then Yuji is the next speaker. Uh, he's going to introduce himself later on. So uh, at Skater, uh, we've been doing a lot for Cassandra to make it at the next level. So we proposed a library called ScaleDB that makes EC, uh, that makes Cassandra EC, EC compliant. And then we proposed and then implemented the uh, group commit logs sync to make it faster. And then we've been doing lots of uh, Jefferson testing for lighter transactions for to make it more reliable. So uh, this talk, we're gonna talk one by one uh, and explaining about why we're doing this and then what we do. So first, uh, AC transactions on Cassandra with ScaleDB. So most of you don't know ScaleDB. So ScaleDB is a universal transaction manager written in Java that makes a non-ACID compliant database ACID compliant. And then Cassandra is the first supported database. So uh, uh, architecture of ScaleDB is uh, like a layered architecture inspired by Deuteronomy. So uh, there is a universal transaction manager uh, on the top, and then there is a storage abstraction layer underneath. And then there, uh, that implements that kind of abstracts the storage specific implementations. And then for Cassandra, uh, there is a Cassandra adapter uh, that implements the storage abstraction, and then that uses a DataStax Java driver to talk with Cassandra. So from Cassandra's perspective, it doesn't even know if it's doing transactions or not, and all the tricks are done by ScaleDB. So um, why we're doing this kind of is transactions with Cassandra, even though Cassandra doesn't support transactions by itself, and then why we're doing this with ScaleDB instead of actually updating Cassandra itself. So for the first question, um, as you know, ACID is a kind of massive feature in some mission critical applications, and uh, Cassandra used to be uh, more like the scalable database for web applications, web services, but it has been getting widely used for enterprise or mission critical applications. And also uh, Cassandra is one of the major open source distributed databases. So that's why we decided to do, do it. And for the second question, um, it'd be great if you can update the Cassandra itself but it's got a lot of risks and burden for actually modifying Cassandra. So we decided not to do it. And then we created a library called ScaleDB to um, enable AC transactions without actually modifying it. And then that's done because um, ScaleDB only dependent on the exposed APIs. So uh, there are no risks for breaking the exist existing code. So um, there are pros and cons in this approach. So for pros, um, first, it's a non-invasive. So no modifications in Cassandra is required. So second, um, 
it can achieve high availability and then high scalability, even though you do transactions. So those properties are kind of essential Cassandra properties, and then those properties are properly sustained even though you do transactions. And then it can achieve flexible deployment. So transaction layer and then storage layer can be independently scaled. So for cons, um, it could be slower than new SQLs like CockroachDB, TiDB, GigabyteDB. So one of the reasons are that um, ScaleDB has more abstraction layers. And also a uh, transaction manager doesn't know, doesn't know much about the uh, storage implementation, storage layouts. And then for a second, uh, it's similar to the first one, but uh, it's hard to optimize since transaction manager doesn't not much information about storage. And the third, uh, no SQL is supported. So you need to write a program to do transactions. So programming interface of ScaleDB is a basically a CRUD interface. So you can do put, get, scan, delete. Uh, and then uh, it's got the begin and the commit semantics. So it actually uh, has a start and then commit method. So, uh, and you can have a literally number of operations in between. And then those are done, executed atomically. And then the architecture of ScaleDB is a client coordinated. So there is no dedicated middleware for ScaleDB. And it is usually used integrated, integrated with uh, web applications. So the data model of ScaleDB is a multi-dimensional map uh, used in big table. And as you know, uh, Cassandra is also a successor of Big Table. So uh, basically, Cassandra and the ScaleDB share the same data model. So let's look at uh, how it does transactions. And then the transaction protocol is based on Cherry Gasser protocol uh, proposed in ICD 2015. And roughly speaking, um, it's got that it it does a two phase commit two phase commit on linearizable operations, and then it uses a wall, but the wall right that is logging, but the wall records are all distributed, and then it uses a single version of optimistic concurrency control. But the original protocol original work is kind of broken a little bit, so we've extended the work by actually correcting the protocol and then adding the serializability support. And the original protocol kind of uh, requires two features in the under underlining databases. One is uh, analyzable read and analyzable conditional update. And the other is an ability for each record. And then both are fine for Cassandra, of course. So let's look at the uh, one by one. So first, uh, transaction commit protocol. And like I explained, uh, it's it's doing a two-phase commit protocol on linearizable operations. And since Cassandra using a Paxos for lightweight transactions, uh, it is similar, pretty similar to Paxos commit. And then the protocol is basically composed of two phases, prepare phase and commit phase. And in prepare phase, uh, it's preparing records to be committed. And in the commit phase, actually commit phase composed of, is composed of two phases, sub phases. And in commit phase one, it's uh, uh, committing the status of transaction. And in commit phase two, it actually committing records. But the, in commit phase one, this is the where, this is the point where a transaction is regarded as committed or aborted. So it can be seen as two phase commit. And for recovery, uh, it applies a lazy recovery. So uncommitted transactions, uncommitted records will be rolled forwarded or rolled backed based on the status of the transactions when they're read. I'm gonna explain the protocol later with example. So for a while, so uh, in ScaleDB, 
while records are all distributed into uh, multiple records. So for each record, there is a after image and then before image. And then there is a table called coordinate table that manages the statuses of transactions. And then for each record, uh, there is application data, of course. And then there is a scalar DB managed metadata marked as blue, like a status version transaction ID for after image. And then for before image, it's got the previous uh, versions of the record to roll back. So as for concurrency control, uh, it uses a single version optimistic concurrency control. And then uh, it can be seen as a simple implementation of snapshot isolation. And then conflicts are detected by a lightweight transactions. So we don't really use um, clocks not even using a uh, hybrid logical clock. And then uh, it supports two isolation levels. Uh, one is a weaker variant of snapshot, snapshot isolation, sometimes called uh, uh, really committed snapshot isolation. And then uh, in addition to the anomalies happening in uh, snapshot isolation, there is a chance of read skew. And it supports serializable as well. So in that case, there, uh, there is no anomalies. So let's look at how it works with example. So let's assume uh, Cassandra, manages a, Cassandra manages a banking application, and then there are two accounts, one and two, and then both have uh, uh, balance 100, whatever the currency unit is. And then client one comes and then he wants to do a payment transaction. So uh, since it's a snapshot isolation, it first reads both records into its local memory space. And then it's doing a transactions locally. So in this case, transferring 20 from one to two, the actual data is application data is updated. And then the status transaction ID versions are also updated. So in the previous phase, uh, the updated records will be reflected to the Cassandra with conditional update. And then it's up, it's gonna update only if the versions and then transaction IDs are the same as the ones it read. So in this case, uh, the versions and the transaction IDs are XXX, YYY, 5 and 4, which is the same as the versions, transaction IDs it read. So it's fine. So it's properly prepared. But let's assume there is another transaction just come around at the same time. And then it, it's read the same record as transaction 1. And it does the similar transaction transferring 10 from one to two. And then those changes will be reflected to the Cassandra. But in this case, it's gonna be failed because uh, the condition mismatch. Uh, the data is already updated by transaction one. So it's a TX1 and six and five, which is not the same as the, the version it's read. So in this case, it failed and then it's gonna be aborted. So now client one wins for the prepare and it's now going to the commit phase one. So uh, client one tries to commit the transaction one and then it's gonna update the status record like this. And then uh, it also uses a lightweight transaction and then the condition is updating only if the transaction ID does not exist. So in this case, there is no transaction ID one, so it can be successfully committed. And in commit phase two, uh, trend one is gonna update the records from prepared to committed. And in this case, also it uses a conditional update and then it updates only if the record is prepared by the transaction ID. And then the reason why we are doing checking the transaction ID is that, uh, you know, um, there might be a case where um, 
they are prepared. And after that, and the transaction comes in and then recover the data and then also issue another transaction to update those data. So by checking the uh, transaction ID, we can um, avoid overwriting the, all the updated data. So uh, for recovery, uh, recovery is lazily done basically when our code is read. So let's see um, how it's gonna handle. So um, there is a phase. And then what if a transaction crashes before prepare phase? In that case, nothing happens in the database. So nothing needs to be done. Basically just leave it as it is. And then the local memory space will be cleared out by automatically by JVM. And then what if a transaction um, crashes after prepare phase, but before prepare phase, uh, commit phase one? In that case, records are prepared, but the, there is no status for the transaction. So the records will be rolled back by another transaction lazily using before image. So what if a uh, transaction crashes after commit phase one and before commit phase two? In that case, records are prepared and then there is a record in transaction status table. So those records will be all forwarded by another transaction lazily, updating status to committed. So um, regarding the sterilizable strategy, um, the basic strategy is uh, we're trying to avoid the anti-dependency, which is a root cause of the um, breaking the sterilizability uh, in snapshot isolation. So uh, we have two implementations. One is called XR write, which is uh, actually converting reads into writes. So there is no anti-dependencies. And then the other is called XR read, which is actually checking the read set after prepared to see if it's not updated by other transactions. So it's actually checking the anti-dependency and if there is anti-dependency, uh, it's gonna be aborted. So here's a benchmark result uh, with uh, ScaleDB on Cassandra in a 100 node cluster. So um, with two different workloads, uh, as you can see, um, it's almost, almost linearly scaled. And then it achieves 90% uh, uh, scalability in both workloads. So um, we've done lots of we've done lots of lots of verification tests uh, with Jackson, and then Yuji is gonna one who is gonna speaking about the Jackson test in our uh, use cases. And um, we've also done the transition commit protocol verification with TLA plus. TLA plus is a formal verification language, and then. We've verified lots of lots of uh, LDB code. I think um, I'm going to stop here and then uh, switching to Yuji. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Yuji. I'm working on improving the performance and the reliability of the ScaleDB. I I am going to talk about a new commit role sync mode called group mode and Jepsen test for LWT. Why we need a new mode? ScalarDB transaction relies on Cassandra durability and the performance. One of the functions to protect our data is commit log. And also the commit log sync affects the performance because the sync, uh, because the sync causes many IO so I proposed a new mode. We can choose group mode in Cassandra 4.0. Group mode satisfies data durability and releases right IO to the commit log disk. Group mode syncs multiple commit logs 
at once and periodically. As you know, commit log is a log of all mutations to a Cassandra node. Commit log provides durability in the case of crash. All writes applies, uh, applies mutations to the name table and appends commit logs to the disk. After a crash happens, the node recovers the data from the commit logs because all the data on the name table have been gone. Commit log sync mode is how to sync the commit logs to the disk. I would like to introduce the existing modes before the detail of a group mode. We can choose the two modes, which are periodic and batch. The default mode is periodic. This mode syncs commit logs to the disk periodically. It's an um, uh, asynchronous sync, not to wait for the completion of the commit log sync. This mode can minimize the number of I.O. because it syncs multiple commit logs at once at that point. The diagram shows five commit logs can be synced at once. However, it is possible to lose some commit logs when crashed in this mode. Appended commit logs after the last sync point are not persisted. And this mode responds with arc immediately, regardless whether the commit logs are synced or not. The second mode is batch. Batch mode syncs commit logs immediately. It's synchronous sync, so the arc means the writes have been persisted. If a crash happens, they can be recovered from the commit logs. The data durability is satisfied by this mode. However, a lot of IOs might degrade the throughput. A parameter batch window is the maximum length of a window to sync, it seems not working. From the mode name batch, you would expect this mode tries to sync more commit logs at once. But batch mode syncs only few commit logs which, which are requested concurrently at that sync point. That's why many small IO are requested to the commit log disk. I summarize the issues of the existing modes. First, periodic mode might lose commit logs. Second, batch mode increases a lot of small IO. To store critical data, we cannot choose periodic mode due to the lack of durability. In fact, we, we recommend batch mode for ScareDB. However, we have a concern about the throughput degradation by increasing I.O. in batch mode. So I propose a new sync mode. Group mode syncs commit roles at once and periodically, like periodic mode. Like batch mode, it's synchronous sync, which responds after syncing the commit roles does not return the arc immediately. Group mode achieves both durability and reducing I.O. by grouping commit log sync. The diagram shows the first commit log is synced at the first sync point. After the sync, the write is completed. The last four commit logs are synced at once at the next sync point. After the sync, the four writes are completed. In this example, this node issued only two I.O. for the five commit rows. 
I evaluated the performance of three node cluster with slow disks, which are 200 IOPS, like hard disk drive. I configured the interval time to sync the controls, 10 milliseconds and 15 milliseconds for group mode. The left graph shows the throughput, which is the number of update operations per second. In batch mode, the throughputs of 2 milliseconds and 10 milliseconds batch window are the same. Group mode looks a bit better than batch mode. Between 10 and 32 threads, the throughput of group mode is better than that of batch mode up to 75%. The latency is also better than that of batch mode or lower throughput. With LWT, many commit rows are issued to update not only the user table, but also the Paxos table. Without LWT, the latency of batch mode is better than that of group mode in 100 ops. That's because few commit rows are issued and batch mode does not have to wait for a sync point. When to use when to use group mode? It's when durability is important. Uh, in the case where we cannot lose critical data, even if all nodes are down unexpectedly. And when the disk IOPS is lower than the request arrival time, arrival rate, the throughput degradation can be avoided by decreasing IO. In my evaluation, it's when the number of threads is between 8 and 32. We can choose batch mode to make each latency low with a faster disk. Batch mode can group as many commit rows as group mode in high concurrency. Each latency is lower by returning the arc immediately. My next topic is Jepson test for LWT. Why we do Jepson test for LWT? Scared DB transaction relies on LWT on Cassandra. How can we check the correctness? Jepson provides functions to inject ports and to verify the linearizability. Data Stacks made Jepson test about five years ago. However, it has not been maintained. That's why I made Jepson test for LWT. Our test is based on Data Stacks test. It has LWT, batch, set, map, and counter test with various ports, which are network ports node crash, clock drift, and node joining. I will introduce our contributions to Jepson testing for Cassandra. First, we replaced Casaforte with area as closure wrapper for Cassandra. That's because Casaforte has not been maintained. I faced on some bugs about getting results on the Cassandra driver. Second, we reload tests with the latest Jepson. The previous LWT test failed, failed due to out of memory to check the long loads. But new Jepson can check the loads by dividing the test to some parts. So the current LWT test works well. I've, mm, let's see, I've not matched some modifications for the latest Jepson 0.2.0 due to a Jepson's bug. I, I reported the bug and uh, it was fixed. The new version uh, 0.2.1 is released today 
So I will match them soon. I'm reporting the result of Cassandra test to the demo mailing list when a new version is released. They are simple tests, which are one minute, one minute testing without port injection. I'm testing Cassandra 4.0 beta with port injections every week. When a test runs repeatedly, sometimes a node couldn't join the cluster before starting a test. I'm not sure what happens. This issue didn't happen with 4.0 alpha. So I, I, will, I will investigate it. And the current test is maintained by Scalar repository. We think the test can be migrated to the official Cassandra, Cassandra repository, since it is not specific to Scalar DB. So we would, uh, we would like to know your thought. Okay, that, mm, that's all. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Hiroyuki and Yuji, for that presentation. Um, just throw it out to the floor now. If there are any questions, please drop them into the chat channel. All right, so I've got one question. Uh, sure. Will the or where whereabouts is the code located for Scala? Is it going? Will it be made open source? Sorry, I couldn't get it. Like, what was the question? Uh, is the is whereabouts is the code located for Scala? Uh, the code is located in the Scalar Labs repo in GitHub. Uh, cool. And there are instructions to build and compile it um, and run it and plug it in. Right, right, right. Yeah. Like uh, we have a getting started document, we have a design document, and then, yeah, so basically you can start um, like after this. Fantastic. Yeah, and we have also uh, Stack Overflow um, tags so that uh, if you have any questions, well, you can free, feel free to ask. All right. Um, well, I think we'll wind the session up here then. Um, so thank you again. Uh, Hiroyuki and Yuji for an excellent presentation and thank you for everyone else that presented as well today. Um, had some really interesting uh, presentations. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.